And uh, while you're doing that, let me say, especially to all of our friends who are watching online right now, we are going to be doing communion at the end of the service. And so if you want to be ready for that, anybody not get a communion cup? Can you raise your hand really quick? I know, yeah, just uh, one or two. And so uh, Ed's going to come up and pass some of those out. Keep your hands up just for a second. And we'll just, just gives people at home time to grab their fish crackers and whatever they have in the fridge to drink. Um, we have been in the middle of this series uh, called Keep Going, Wisdom and Encouragement from Second Timothy. And the idea of this series is we have this older guy during the time of the early church named Paul who just had amazing journeys and adventures really in the name of Jesus, talking about, telling people about the Lord, starting churches, just doing amazing things, also experienced a lot of difficulties and trials and everything. And here he is, older, and we know toward the end of his life, uh, in fact, not just at the end of the life, we know that he's going to be executed for his faith, and he's writing this letter to this younger protege of his, this guy that he's poured into, telling him, in essence, keep going. This is worth it. Within all the trials and all the difficulties Timothy's had with the, the, the painful situations he's experienced in his community, Paul knows what he's going through, and so Timothy, keep going, keep pressing on, and so we're trying to encourage ourselves with this, in this, just within the things we experience, the things that we're going through, the trials and the difficulties that maybe we've had not only over the last couple of years, but in life just in general, maybe still processing from even beyond that. Let's keep going. How do we do this? This is worth it. Uh, trusting in the strength of God and the encouragement of community. And so um, kind of moving into a different section of the letter, though, as we kind of take this letter of encouragement and how Paul's going to really focus it on a specific topic. And as we get into it, let me start off by saying this. One thing that I think is super awesome about living today, not only in our culture, but really anywhere in the world, is how no one ever, ever fights over differences of opinion. I mean, generally speaking, people are great at stopping to understand, being slow to speak, being empathetic, allowing for differences of opinion, speaking kindly for one another, striving to find common ground in unity. It is super refreshing to know we are living in a time when people are like that. Wouldn't you agree? Yes. And so I just want to clarify, I did not get into a car accident this week. I did not fall and hit my head really, really bad or anything like that. And based on some of the even like kind of eye rolling and giggles as I was saying all of that, we know that pretty much reality is the opposite of what I just described, isn't it? We, we, this phrase gets used a lot even now. Our country is divided like never before. If somebody has a difference of opinion, many will devalue or dismiss or just write them off. Not only what they're saying, but maybe even the person as a human being doesn't matter what label somebody resonates with, whether it's Republican or Democrat or none, none, none of those are conservative or liberal. Everyone does it. And so what is a Christian supposed to do? When we're talking about information and content, but also the people that we are and how we process this, how does a Christian, somebody who says they follow Jesus, or maybe you're here and you're like, what is this Christian thing? What is this Jesus thing? What, how does Jesus want people to be? How are we supposed to navigate this? Well, what Paul addresses in the next part of 2 Timothy can help us to answer these questions, I think. False teachers is a concept that was a big, used a lot in the New Testament because it was a very big deal. The idea behind it is that there's Jesus and then there's the gospel. The idea of Jesus and who he is and what he came to do and what he accomplished and the reality of the gospel, the good news of who he is and what he came to do and the life that he offers people and the life that he invites people to and that resurrected life of grace and mercy and love and purpose. There's the truth of Jesus and the truth of the gospel. In talking about the two, there is truth about Jesus and then there is distortion of that truth. There, we can talk about the truth of the gospel, but then there's also a distortion of the truth of the gospel. Saying things that aren't 
true about who Jesus is, aren't true about what he did or didn't do, or what he expects or don't, didn't expect. And the people that pushed distortions of Jesus, who proclaimed or shared distortions of the gospel, the New Testament writers called them false teachers. They are the ones who did the distorting. And this is a huge, huge deal. Why? Because truth about Jesus and truth about the gospel isn't just interesting information. It's not just giving us something for some type of trivia night or something like that. Jesus is offering people a way of life, a new life, a new identity. So to teach falsely about him is to distort that invitation. To teach falsely about him is to distort the life that he's giving. To teach falsely about him is to distort the expectations he has for us or the expectations we can have for him. And so the New Testament writers address this and attack this and every, would never left it ever to, to go because they want Jesus proclaimed in the truth of who he is. They want the gospel known for what it really is and not allowing people to reject an idea of Jesus that isn't true about Jesus. Does that make sense? And so false teaching was a huge, huge deal. And here in the section of 2 Timothy that we're going to look at today, specifically between verses 14 to 26, Paul is going to help Timothy navigate false teachers. Because this is the, one of the big issues not only Paul dealt with continually, but this is the issue Timothy's facing where he's at in the church in Ephesus. He's having to deal with people who are distorting the truth of Jesus, distorting the truth of the gospel, and attacking Timothy within it. And so when dealing with the wrong info, with dealing with people who distort the truth, Timothy, here's what you should do and what you shouldn't do. Man, wouldn't it be great to know what to do in those situations? When you're faced with information about Jesus that doesn't sound correct, or to even know what's correct, to, and when you're interacting with somebody that doesn't agree with you or is pushing back, is blatantly trying to argue about stuff, wouldn't it be great to know how to handle truth? Now, anyone? I mean, is that something? It would be great to know what to do in these moments. Well, that's what we're going to ask the Lord to speak to us about this morning as we get into this next section of Timothy. And so before we do, let's do that. Let's pray and ask God to speak to us. And so, God, we do pray. We pray that, God, we thank you so much for your presence. We thank you for the fact that you love us. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for the truth and the reality of the crucifixion and that of the resurrection, God, that you died in our place, that you conquered sin, you conquered death, you rose from the grave, and you invite us into that resurrected life. We are grateful for the Savior that you are. And so, God, help us to have a sensitivity to truth, a hunger for understanding, God, let us be aware of your grace and your mercy. God, of your presence caring for us. God, as we think about the individuals that we know, the people that we interact with, I pray you would equip us this morning. I pray that your word would equip us to engage people with truth and with love. God, help us to hear the things we need to see. I pray, Spirit, you would fill this place. I pray it would be real that you are here to us, that we would know the truth of that. Help us to be sensitive to what you're saying. It's in your name we pray. Amen. As we go through this next section, just about this idea of false teaching, here's the line that I want to get across and I want you to remember. Right understanding and right character is more important than being right. Right understanding and right character is more important than being right. This is the big thing that we're going to talk about today. And it starts here in verse 14 of chapter 2. Remind them of these things, Paul says to Timothy, Timothy, remind them of these things and ch charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. Do your best to present to God, excuse me, to, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. But avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their, walk, and their talk will spread like gangrene. Among them are, we're going to call them him and Phil. 
Among them are him and Phil, who, were served from, who have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. They are upsetting the faith of some. But God's firm foundation stands, bearing this seal. The Lord knows those who are his, and let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. Now, thinking about this message and thinking about what this passage is about and kind of just chewing on it this week, if you will, and kind of getting my, having my thoughts together, I read um, a news uh, update, from uh, an email update from one of the news outlets that I follow. I'm not going to say which one it is because I don't want that to be distracting. But when I read it, I was like, that's exactly what we're talking about. And so the beginning of this newsletter started off, the editor said this, our columnists don't write in order to win awards. They write to have impact, to educate and entertain because they love to write, because they're the kind of people who are excited to constantly learn new things, meet people, and challenge old ways of thinking. Now, whether you agree with that idea of journalism, or whatever or not, the first thing there is the key. What does he say? Our columnists don't write in order to win awards. They write to have an impact. And that's exactly what Paul is saying in this paragraph when we bring it to the idea of faith and following Jesus. Followers of Jesus do not get into conversations or interactions with people to win arguments. They get into conversations and interactions to show and proclaim Jesus. We do not get into conversations with people to win and say that we're right. We get into conversations with people to be able to talk and show what Jesus is all about. And so Paul makes comments to warn about this, specifically to warn against picking fights with people. He said in verse 14, Charge them before God not to quarrel about words, which does no good, but only ruins the hearers. And then in verse 16, avoid irreverent babble because it only leads to more and more ungodliness and spreads like gangrene. Now, obviously, words are important. Paul had to use words in order to make the statement for people not to quarrel about them. So this isn't him saying, don't talk about spiritual things, don't have even conversation. One pastor by the name of Kent Hughes, he points out that the emphasis that Paul is talking about here when he says do not quarrel about words is that the emphasis on word, word fights. Don't have word fights with people. Arguing just for the sake of arguing. Just sounding smart, just trying to come across a certain way without caring about the subject matter or not caring about the implications of what we say. He also said irreverent battle, babble, just chattering on about spiritual things without a clue of spiritual things, debating and critiquing spiritual things without having a sensitivity or care about spiritual things. In our day, I think, uh, how does that kind of bridge the gap to us? I think in our day, I think similar things we'd see to what Paul is warning Timothy about are when people raise questions just for the sake of raising questions without caring about getting answers. When people just like to put out their doubts without trying to find out what's true. Wanting to play the devil's advocate, not to help or to sharpen arguments, but just to be ornery and difficult. This is what Paul's talking about. We need to learn. We need to study. We need to question we need to challenge. Paul isn't saying to avoid any of those things. But Paul's warning is to check your goal. When we engage people, when we talk, when we process information and interactions, are we processing to grow or to help others grow? Or am I just debating to debate? Am I just picking a fight? Because to do that, is actually destructive. Because when you just want to pick a fight, when you just want to talk about stuff and argue with people, if you just want to put the comments, you're removed from the implications of what you're saying. You're removed from the implications of what your conclusions might be. You're removed from the implications of being okay without a conclusion. And that's dangerous. That's destructive. In fact, Paul starts naming names to show what happens when that happens. These two people, him and Phil, 
They have swerved from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already happened. To just talk about our ideas and just, well, what about, or how come this, or whatever, without taking it outside of ourselves to truth and history and study and information and experts and try to figure out outside of ourselves what is going on and clarify things and then think about the ramifications of that is destructive. Because the ideas I come up with might be brilliant, but I don't know if I don't check them to reality. And so here's two people who said, well, Jesus has already returned. He's already come back, contrary to what the scriptures and Jesus himself says. Without grounding our questions in truth and the pursuit of truth, we invite error into our thinking. And when you invite error into your thinking, we also invite error into our lives. If we're not supposed to be combative, if we're not just supposed to pick a fight, then how are we supposed to be? Well, he tells Timothy in verse 15. That's the verse here. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Do your best. Put some effort in it. Have some passion. Put the zeal. Make every effort for what? To present yourself. To let your body, your life, who you are be evidence of something. To be exhibit A. That you and your life would show. Show what? Somebody, one approved by God. One that when God sees how we are, yes, that's what it's supposed to look like. One that a worker who has no need to be ashamed. I mean, you think about any job you've had, or even back to the being younger when mom and dad ask us to do something. When the job is done right, and we've done it the best we can, even if it's not perfect, we've done the best we can, we've done the job, we can come in at the end of the day with our head held high and say, look at what I, I accomplished. But when we don't work hard, when we do shoddy work, when we procrastinate, when it's just horrible, we typically are trying to avoid the boss, Right? And so he live in such a way that at the end of the day, what you did, you do not have to be ashamed about what you've done. Rightly handling the word of truth. Not just having the information, but knowing the significance of it, to process it, to use it. We've seen in our world over the last two days, a lot of people who know who, how to look up medical information, but have no idea how to handle medical information. And so what Paul is saying here, you can read the Bible, but you need to know how to handle the Bible. You need to take this information and know how it connects and know what it communicates and know what it signifies. It's not just this, this isn't just something to throw around in whatever we like and ignoring the parts that are uncomfortable to us. We have to rightly handle the word of truth. This entire verse presents the opposite of what Paul was warning about. He was warning, be wary of people who are all talk, who just want to sow dissension, who debate to debate, who just want to criticize but have no example of their life to speak of. Timothy, don't be like that. Timothy, instead of being like them, be a person who's faithful to Jesus. Be a person who is faithful to the teachings of Scripture. Be a person who is faithful to what it means to be a child of God. In essence, Paul is telling Timothy what James says in another part of the New Testament, but be doers of the word and not hearers only. It isn't just knowing the information. It isn't just knowing, being able to talk about the information. It's about living the information. To not just understand and be able to talk about spiritual things, about Jesus, and, and just debate and converse, because that's the problem. To just be able to debate and get nick picky and da, 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 you can walk away from that and be no different. And in that, it actually can move you away from God. Yes, we study. Yes, we challenge. Yes, we sharpen one another. All of that. But what are we trying to do? We need to be implementing. We need to be faithful. And so think through the implications of this for me. Like I said, he's encouraging learning, encouraging understanding, but he's also saying that how I go about implementing the truth is 
equally important. We need to have the healthy dialogue, the disagreement, all those types of things. But at the end of the day, all, if all we want to do is to show somebody that we're right and they're wrong, then we have missed the point of being a follower of Jesus. If all we want to do is tell somebody why they're messed up, why they're wrong, why they're in error, and why I'm right, and walk away, we have missed the point of being a follower of Jesus. And so Paul says, don't be like the person who just wants to argue to show that they think that they're right. You be a person who's striving to understand what is true and to show in your life what is true. And so he, he doesn't just give Timothy this charge. He's going to unpack it in the next two paragraphs, but it causes us to evaluate and ask some things. Do we pick fights with people or do we engage people? Do we just want to criticize or do we want to actually build relationships? Do we just kind of throw a disagreement bomb in and walk away or do we actually build bridges to continue conversation? Again, sometimes we need to speak really hard truth, but we don't have to be a jerk as we do that. And so Paul is challenging us. And so in this, your right character and right understanding is more important than being right. Because you can think you're right and not be correct about your understanding. And you can think you're right and your character is pretty jacked up. We have to know that what we're saying is true and we have to live that truth out. And that's what Paul gets into the next part. Paul, Timothy, be this type of a person and here's how you do it. First off, he's going to emphasize the idea of honor. Being a person of honor. Godly evaluation leads to godly opportunities. Listen to what he says in verse 20. Now in a great house there are not only vessels of gold, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. Now, reading this passage, here's what comes to mind for me. Al along with our beloved dog, Darla, in the Moss house, we actually also have two turtles. And so they are Turt and Shelly. And so they smiled really well for the camera this morning. Now, we have to clean their tank periodically. The other day, Jeanette cleaned the tank, and she came in, and she had this old popcorn container that we would use at different time watching movies, and she had this old strainer. I feel like it's very important to clarify that's not the only strainer that we own. But she said, I use these to clean the turtles tank. So she put the turtles in the popcorn thing so they were like running around in the house because Darla would not let that happen. And then she strained the rocks through the uh, strainer to kind of get the turtle stuff off. So she, I'm going to put these in the hall closet and we'll just use these to clean the turtle. This will be the cleaning turtle stuff and we'll kind of keep them separate from everything else. And so again, I want to clarify for anybody that's been to my house and you've eaten pasta. We did not strain the pasta through that strainer. We have the turtle cleaning strainer, and we have the people eat stuff through other strainer. So two completely different things. Are we, some of you, I'm seeing your faces. You've been in my house. There's a slight look of disgust. We don't use that strainer for the pasta, okay? But what if we did? Think about if you were to come over to our place, and we're eating pasta, and I say, oh, man, it was so inconvenient today. I mean, we were cleaning the turtle tank out, and we knew we had to cook this stuff, and so we just got done cleaning it and then made the pasta and took it from the turtles and just strained it. And it was just so easy to not have to go through all that extra cleaning. How would you feel? Blech. Like, you'd want to puke, right? Why would you take this nasty thing and put it in the food that we're about to eat? You can't do that. You don't use that for this. Well, Paul, that's the exact imagery that Paul is using here. The idea of utensils that would be found in homes for cooking or for other things. Some would be super nice, fine china-like. Some would be speed, normal, everyday stuff. Some would be used for cooking. Some would be used, there'd be utensils for unclean things, like cleaning the ancient toilet or whatever that was. Basically, they would have the nice strainer for cooking, and then they would have the nasty one you would use for the turtle tanks. What Paul is saying in verses 21 and 21, excuse me, 20 and 21, when he says, 
Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. The first thing we need to see within that that Paul is saying is that there any vessel can be cleaned for usefulness. Any vessel. I don't care if you think it's gold and precious and amazing and superior, or you think it's old and nasty and messed up, and why would you want to use that? Any vessel can be cleansed for usefulness. Because the reality is, is that when we're talking about us, it's not us that's doing the transforming. It's not us that's doing the restoring. It's not us that's forgiving sins and cleansing from unrighteousness. It's Jesus. And so he says in Ephesians, it's by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. There is nothing that anyone has done in this room right now that cannot be forgiven by the Lord. There is nothing that you have done in your life. And you might be thinking, oh, but man, my story... This is in the category where that's the utensil God's not going to want to touch. You need to know there is nothing that you have done in your life. There is nothing that has happened in your life that makes God think less of you. He loves you. He knows everything. And he loves you. He loves you. He loves you. It says in Romans 5, 8, for God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He loves you, he loves you, he loves you. There is nothing that he won't forgive. Now, when we acknowledge the reality of the truth of the gospel and we begin that life with him, when we're forgiven and we're restored to who, how we're meant to be with him, we have to live that life. We have to be obedient. We have to be faithful. Paul says in another letter in Philippians, he says, work hard to show the results of your salvation, obeying God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. And so this is, yes, God forgives us. Yes, he gives us new life. We have to be obedient to that. We have to be faithful to that. We need to look at ourselves and be honest with ourselves. In what ways am I reflecting the character of Jesus? And in what ways am I not? In what ways am I be obedient to his teaching? In what ways am I not? In what ways am I honoring his love? In which ways am I not? And this is not to make us, to shame us and to make us feel worthless or anything like that because that's not what God does. He says in 1 John, if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The Romans passage, he loves you while you're in the middle of us being all of that. God loves you. This isn't meant to shame us, but we have to see the reality of the things that are in our lives. We have to be honest with our sins and deal with our junk. And so James says in his letter, come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, for your loyalty is divided between God and the world. Let there be tears for what you have done. Let there be sorrow and deep grief. Let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will lift you up in honor. Again, it's not to shame us. When you read that part where it says, let there be tears for what you've done, let there be sorrow and deep grief, let there be sadness instead of laughter and gloom instead of joy, God is not describing a constant 24-7 state that he wants depressed followers. That's not what he's offering you. But when we look at our sin, when we look at our struggles, that's not something we should go, oh, well, everybody does it. When we think about the things that we mess up in life, that's not something we should get a big smile on our face out and go, well, I just did it just like you. Or what about this person? Or man, God's going to forgive me. No, when we mess up, it should break our hearts. When we fail, that's something that should bother us. We should know this. That's not how I'm supposed to be. That's not what he saved me for. And so we got to own, again, it's not to shame us, but we still have to own our lives. And so God says, come to me and find forgiveness. Humble yourselves and I will lift you up in honor. We need, when we screw up, we can't just go, ah, 
No, we have to own it and deal with it. Because the truth about Jesus is on the line. He says in Matthew 5, Let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. If our lives are to reflect the heart and character of God, and parts of them are not, and we start talking about Jesus, but our life isn't in sync with that, then our words don't matter. That's why I say that godly evaluation leads to godly opportunities, because when I can look at my life and hold myself up to the reality of Jesus and say, you know what, the way that I talk, the way that I think, the way that I respond to people, this situation, whatever it is, this isn't godly. When I see that and I go, okay, but what does godliness look like? And I start doing that, that is getting my life in line with who Jesus is, and that creates opportunities for me now that my life matches my words. And so he says, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be honorable, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. And the reality is, is your coworker is a great work for you. Your neighbor is a great work for you. Not people are not projects. But in the reality of interacting with people and engaging people, if our life doesn't match our words, our life is discrediting our words. And whatever we say about Jesus, if our life doesn't match it, we're discrediting and we're giving Jesus a bad name. So when our life doesn't match who Jesus is, that should bother us, and we do something about it. We ask forgiveness. We make adjustments. We get help. We get accountability. We get counseling. We get somebody to walk alongside of us. We have a community guide us, but we do what it takes to deal with our junk. And so we have to be honest. We have to evaluate. We have to graciously help one another. And I don't need to run through a list of examples you know what it is in your life, just like I do. And so let's have some godly evaluation and come to God and ask for his forgiveness and ask for grace and ask for wisdom and how to make adjustments and be obedient to him so our lives match our words. He then's going to say, pursue. Last thing really quickly. Godly responsibility leads to a godly life. In verse 22, he says, So flee youthful passions, and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels, and the Lord's servant must not, must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone. Excuse me, able to teach, patient, patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape from the snares of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. This whole paragraph rests on these two words, flee and pursue. The idea of flee, flee from what? Youthful passions. Now normally, some, a lot of times when somebody talks about this, they're immediately going to go to things about sex, sexuality, physical stuff. That is not what it's talking about. Because what's going on in the context? The context is about how we engage people how we pick fights with people, how we process information. The youthful, the youthful passions here is an issue of pride. Having to be right, not being teachable, not thinking about the ramifications of my actions, not caring about the ramifications of my actions in other people's lives or the long-term reality of mine. That is an immature, youthful thing that we are to run from. And that is the sobering truth. Just because we get older doesn't mean we grow up. Just because we get older doesn't mean we mature. Because to just be right and not care about the person's life I'm talking to is a very immature thing. And God says, run from that idea. I mean, we are in the middle of Halloween right now, week away. The horror movies are out on every channel. And what is the constant trope in horror movies? Really bad thing happening in a scary room? Do they go away from it or do they run to it? They run to it every time, right? And if you watch that movie, you see it, it's like, why are you going in there? Shadowy place, weird breathing, shadows are moving. Oh, let's go see what's in there. No, run the other way. 
Why would you do that? Common sense, bolt that way. Well, the reality is, is you know what's in those shadows? You know what's in those rooms? Pride and wanting to be right. And the horror of the destruction that that can do. And what Paul is saying is break the trope. Don't be right. Don't be judgmental. Run that way. And don't just run away from that. Don't just flee that, but pursue intent, effort, not running directionless, not running clueless, but intense effort toward a goal. And what is the goal? Christ-likeness. Being like Jesus, pursuing righteousness, having the character of Christ, faithfulness, believing in him, not ourselves, love, the very embodiment of God's character, peace, community, this is not just myself, but greater than myself, kindness, how I act toward people, able to teach, and that's the great one within all of this. Well, I'm not going to be a teacher. No, but you're going to engage people. And any teacher worth their salt doesn't just want to get up and talk at people. They want their students to understand. A bad teacher is one that just gets up in front, says the lecture, walks away, and can care less about their students. The best teachers are the ones who knows their students, knows what their students need, and tries to do everything they can to help the student get it. And that's the idea here. And that's the dangerous thing in the church today that we all need to think about. Because there are people that have the idea, I just need to proclaim Jesus, and if they don't like it, too bad. Well, maybe the way that you're proclaiming Jesus is blocking the truth of Jesus. Because you don't care about the ramifications of how it comes across. And you need to think about how it sounds to somebody, because it doesn't sound like you're communicating the grace and love of Jesus sounds like you just want to let them know that they're different from you and they're wrong. And so we need to be mindful of how we talk. Are we able to teach? Meaning, can we make the gospel make sense to people? Pursue these things. Why? Because verse 25 and 26, wouldn't it be amazing if that person who disagrees with you, that person who vehemently opposes everything you believe about Jesus, the person that is in conflict, the person who's against all of this stuff, wouldn't it be amazing if how you pursued Jesus helped them find Jesus? Wouldn't it be amazing if that person who voted different than you found Jesus? Wouldn't it be amazing if that person who thinks about social issues different than you, wouldn't it be amazing if they found Jesus? What if that person that you just, oh, never given a chance if they found Jesus? Because that's been the failure of the church over the last couple years. We have insulted the other so much that we don't realize they are seeing our words. And they see us talk about Jesus a little bit after that. And why would they want anything to do with us? And so we have to pursue godliness. And so what does it look like in the middle of conflict in the middle of disagreement, to take that and run it toward Jesus. Run it toward righteousness, faith, love, peace, community, kindness, and making sense of things, rather than just, here's why you're wrong. You have opportunities to share the love of God that I won't have and no one else will have. And God trusts you with those. And I hope that you see the gravity and the importance of those moments and you pursue him within him so his light can shine through you. We're going to bring this to a close by receiving communion this morning. Hopefully by now you have one of the packets, and if you're at home, you have stuff. Uh, One thing, if you've never done communion with us before, uh, if you're here and you have one of these, there's two little flaps. If you take the clear one off, it'll pull out the very um, delicious wafer from the top. And that's about as accurate as the way I started this message. Um, And then there's the juice inside. Just hold off pulling off the gray one. We'll receive communion together in a moment. One thing we always do is we always take a moment of just quiet prayer, reflection. As we feed on these elements and what they represent, we want to take the words of Scripture and what we've heard into our own lives and feed on those. And so how does this challenge you? How does this convict you? Is there something you need to come before the Lord and confess? Is there... Somebody that you've been conversing with over the last couple of years you need to think through differently? Is there something about your relationship with him you need to be honest about? Or maybe you just need to shut up and be quiet 
and let him talk to you. But whatever that is, let's just be quiet before him for a moment, and then we'll receive communion together. And so God, I pray you would speak to our hearts. You know exactly what it is we need to hear, what we've needed to hear, and how we need to put it into practice. We know what we've heard, and now what we need to do. And so God, I pray you would be with us in this moment, make us aware of your presence. And so let's be quiet before him for a moment. juice and representing the body of Christ broken for us the sacrifice made in our place his shed blood the reason why we have forgiveness of sin they also represent the reality of the resurrection and that he conquered sin he conquered death and just as we take these in and these nourish our body he invites us into a new life he invites us into that resurrected life so we're reminded of what he's done and who we are. We're also reminded of how we are to interact and live in this world, even in the moments when we're dealing with distorters. When there's conflict. When we don't agree with somebody. So we're reminded of what it means to be his representatives. That he forgives, he restores, and he wants to use us. And so God, we pray that you would penetrate our hearts and our excuses with the truth of your love truth of the gospel. God, I pray that you would forgive us for the times when we pursue pride, when we put ourselves before you, before others. God, I pray that you would remind us of your love for us, remind us of your crucifixion. Remind us, God, of the resurrection, of what you have invited us into, who that new identity, that new life we have in you. God, I pray that you would make this church a beacon of your light, I pray that you would use us to draw people to you, not repel them and push them away. Let us see the moments where we fail so we can make changes. Let us help one another to grace and in love, to guide one another to you. But God, I pray that you would approve of this faith, this family of faith. We ask all these things in your name. We remember all that you have done. Let's receive communion together. grateful for your broken body, for your shed blood, the cross and the empty tomb. Thank you for this life. It's in your name we pray. Amen. If you want to just hold on to those and when service is over, um, there's a garbage can in the back. You can dump them in there. We're going to close with this last song, just declaring our need for the Lord. And I think especially as we think through processing truth, processing situations, we need to remember how much we need Jesus, and we all seem to remember how much the person we're engaging needs Jesus. And let that be what guides us. And so let's worship him now. <laughs> 